we are now on the cloud. Okay. All right, passing it on back to you both. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about accessibility today. Um, and I'm happy to be here at the Touring Way Book Dash. Uh, this is just some information about how to, I'm dogdenetics.com, about how to get in touch with me. Um, so, first, uh, our task in thinking about developing an accessibility guide for the Turing Way is to figure out what accessibility means. Um, in the last few years in my work, there have been kind of two levels of, of definition. Um, the first way that I'm used to thinking about it because of my own personal experience uh, is accessibility for people with disabilities. And some of the practices we use to make things accessible for disabilities would be um, making sure that the materials we put out there are, can be navigated with a screen reader, which also means uh, no mouse, uh, keyboard, keyboard navigable, and keyboard navigable also helps people with mobility disabilities who need to use switches or other devices other than mice to control their computers. Um, we provide live captions for technical talks so that we overcome the fact that automatic captions are not, um, not um, accurate enough for technical work. Um, not sure how I lost my... Um, we wanna avoid unnecessary cognitive complexity and we provide frequent breaks. Um, I know particularly I'm going to talk a little bit about long COVID now because so many people have it. Um, there's a lot of issues with, with fatigue um, and also some, some cognitive difficulties. Um, so when I worked on USAR 2021 with Andrea and a whole big, great team of people, uh, we, we thought a lot about other kinds of accessibility that I learned more about. So examples of this would be um, making sure that materials uh, can be used by people who have lower bandwidth access to the internet. Um, and, and we can say a lot more about that. Um, I know and one, one point I'd like to make is in a Zoom meeting, not everybody has to have their video on and sometimes that can lower the bandwidth that's required a lot. Um, and we also want to make sure that you don't require the absolute latest technology to be able to view and interact with the materials. People might have older machines or some people might be connected. Some people only have mobile and might be connecting uh, on their cell phone. And another one might be um, considering people attending from different time zones. And uh, it might be really, I, I know as a New Yorker um, that New York and Australia are really challenging, <laughs> um, but um, making sure that everybody at least gets a chance. One of the things that we did in USAR 2021 was that kind of each day had a, a maximal convenience for a different part of the world. Um, so uh, this is a, just a reference to the Oh, that was, yeah, that was the reference. Now I'm gonna just, uh, Andrea gave us a great definition yesterday. Um, you know, the, the narrow disability related sense is that it's a community-wide behavioral, social, technical decisions we take to make sure that people can participate. Um, and I really love the fact that she included the behavioral and social parts. Um, I tend to focus on the logistical technology part, but certainly making people feel a part of things and welcome is, is important. I'll talk mostly about technical things today, but um, in the discussion, we can absolutely address the, the social and behavioral parts and how we can welcome people. Um, and then in the in the second sense, uh, Andrea goes on to say that accessibility is going beyond people with disabilities, practices that enable participation for more people, like like the examples of uh, considering bandwidth and, and technology and things like that. Um, 
So here are just a quick a quick few um, items about about the social part. Um, so language matters a lot. Um, people with disabilities generally prefer really plain direct language um, without uh, euphemisms or attacking attaching a lot of cultural stories. So it's perfectly fine to say things like blind and deaf. The problem comes when those words are used as insults. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's great to ask if you're talking to an individual person, it's great to ask them how they uh, describe their disability. It's also great to do some research and find out how a community uh, refers to their disability. Um, things, things involving special and challenged and things like that are, are things that, that, that are, are kind of more alienating than, than not. Um, and we have these cultural stories, at least from my perspective in the US that uh, disabled people and the things that we do, the accessibility practices that we engage in are, are burdens or are costly or take too much work. Um, and the story that disabled people are inspiring is, is really old and hard for a lot of us. Um, Really great to communicate if you're having an event, communicate on the website and the social media, um, you know, what, what accessibility practices you are uh, going to engage in so that people don't have to identify themselves to ask you. Not everybody wants to, wants to be out there and, and, and say what they need. So it's great if they can look it up. Um, also to have a designated contact for accessibility questions makes me feel like someone has considered this and like I'm not just emailing a general information email where people won't even know what I'm talking about as far as using a screen reader and things like that. Um, so getting back to the more technical uh, main point, when we think about the Turing way, what, what, what do we need to have access to? Um, of course, the Turing way book should be available to everyone. Um, and uh, the, the tools that we use to produce the book also need to be accessible to everyone because, uh, you know, it's, it's probably not obvious to everybody because people with disabilities aren't, aren't so obvious in, in science. Um, and have been kind of invisible, but we are out here and we do want to contribute. And uh, although I am contributing about accessibility, mostly for this book dash, I certainly hope to contribute, you know, in other dimensions in the future. Um, so the, the Turing Way website needs to be accessible to everybody. Uh, might be good to have accessibility and inclusion policies, which it probably does. Um, the meetings that we have, for example, on Zoom need to be accessible to everyone. The way that we plan meetings, like Eventbrite, um, when messaging like we use on, uh, why am I getting a Zoom thing here? Um, so the messaging on Slack has to be accessible to everyone. Uh, the repository that we use, which in our case is GitHub, has to be accessible to everyone. And the social media posts that we make, um, you know, need to have alt text or or uh, graphics that are easy to see for people low, for with low vision. If we have videos, they need to be captioned, things like that. So some of these uh, tools that we use have accessibility shortcomings. And here are some examples of workarounds. Uh, Zoom's automatic captions, you may be watching them now. Um, it would probably be okay for the talk I'm giving right now, but if there is a lot of technical stuff, a lot of talking about code and, and package names and function names and things like that, it's just not gonna be accurate enough for a deaf person to really be able to learn and follow along. Um, for uh, video conferencing, I know that uh, deaf colleagues really 
like uh, Google because within the captions or the transcript, it, it tells them which person is speaking, which I guess is sometimes hard to follow on platforms that don't do that, like Zoom. Uh, I noticed that Zoom just, uh, when I logged in, even since yesterday, there's a new update of Zoom. So these things also can change pretty rapidly. Um, Slack has a lot of screen reader weirdness. I can only follow links if they're in a main message and not in replies. Um, and, and it's sometimes hard to choose the right link if there's more than one link in a message. Uh, and here's one that we're already doing. We've got Etherpad, uh, which is uh, pretty much the only really good uh, way for a screen reader user to do simultaneous editing. Um, some people with Windows computers have a pretty good time using Google Docs. Uh, I really don't. Um, but there are also some shortcomings to be aware of. I was working with Andrea on one yesterday and I found that the letters weren't read back to me when I tried to go back and fix my typos. So that was, that was kind of hard. Um, but uh, just kind of being aware of these, you're never probably gonna find apps that don't have any accessibility issues that need to be worked around, but hopefully the more uh, attention we can bring to these things, maybe companies like Slack will pay more attention. I know I've been in contact with them for a long time on some of them. Um, so I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk specifically about alt text. Um, alt text is um, attached to images for people who are using a screen reader, which won't just provide any description of the image. Um, and the images can be anything from uh, cute pictures or diagrams to help you understand like, like flow diagrams are probably a big thing in the Turing way. Um, and also obviously data visualizations, uh, which is data visualizations are something that I thought about a lot. Um, they are required to adhere to accessibility laws in some countries and also guidelines like uh, W3C uh, and WebAIM have a lot of a lot of guidelines about making internet things accessible. Um, and it's also just really important to make sure that you know you want to communicate your data and uh, you know you you want it to reach everyone. Um, So what does alt text do? Um, there are some important questions that I think it answers for me, and that's, uh, you know, why did you include this image in your media? Um, so you might have included it because it shows the relationship between X and Y in a graph. Uh, might describe uh, the patterns of COVID-19 incidents on a map, or uh, it might compare different groups uh, using bar charts in a, a set of faceted graphs. So this is my snarky New York uh, commentary on this. Uh, there are things that alt text isn't, or at least the, some of these are ingredients that make up an alt text, but are not sufficient. So um, automatically generated alt texts can't really get at that question. Uh, or those two questions of why am I including this image? And also to tell you, you know, kind of what the take home message is of the image. Um, it's not just a title because you might be able to get that from other parts of the media and the title traditionally, at least in scientific literature, a title is not very informative as far as what the data are saying. Uh, same with the caption. Uh, access labels on the graph, that, th those are really important things, but they're not enough. Uh, humorous remarks, uh, humor is allowed, but um, some people, particularly on social media or on the web, are, are using alt text as, as kind of a place to hide Easter eggs or something um, and, and not to provide the actual meaning of the uh, graphic that you included. Uh, 
So how long is alt text? Um, you may be frustrated that I'm going to tell you that it depends. It depends a lot on the context it's in, how technical is that um, uh, material that you're showing. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, context and complexity uh, are two aspects that, that will impact the length. Um, you should use your own judgment, even though um, some media have character limits for all text. I, I don't know uh, if you're producing a website, I'm not sure what, what the, if, if there is a limit. Um, I know, you know, on, on Twitter, it's, it's pretty short and we can talk about ways to get around that. Um, a lot of guidelines really emphasize brevity and I, I really kind of disagree. Um, some of them suggest that you need two or three sentences or, or one or two sentences, but for complex data visualizations, that's just really not gonna be enough. And I think answering the questions of why you're including the visualization and what it says um, about your data are the most important things. So I'm gonna talk about two models for what to include in uh, all text for data visualization. Um, the first one is kind of based on ingredients. This is one that I came up while working with Sylvia Canelon on um, looking at how often all texts are used in a Twitter uh, data visualization learning group um, called Tidy Tuesday for the R community. Um, and it's really based on the long experience I've had trying to get access to data visualizations. And I'm old enough that when I was in grad school, I had to have humans you know, read things to me because it wasn't all online yet. And I had to have graphs described to me and stuff. So I, I often had to ask a lot of questions to get the information I needed to understand what was in a graph. Um, so really great to kind of set the, set the expectation and framework by telling me what kind of graph it is. You know, is it a bar plot? Is it a scatter plot? If it's, there's all kinds of fancy, new, innovative kinds of data visualizations now, and they might require more description if they're not as common as these traditional ones. Um, what variables on, are on the axes? What is the range of the data? Um, kind of gives me a space to fill in when I start to understand what is the relationship with the data. And, and um, you know, this kind of goes back to the second essential question of, of what, um, you know, what are the data saying and why are you showing it? Um, and here's another snarky New York opinion. Don't write along all text that just has kind of the introductory information without telling me what the data says. I don't really want to spend time um, reading about what's on the axes if I can't find out anything else. Um, alt texts are different when you're interacting with a screen reader. Uh, normally when you're interacting with text, you can go word by word, you can go sentence by sentence, you can skip the rest of things. When you read an alt text, uh, it's all in one big, bunch. So I have to read the whole thing wondering whether I'm going to understand the point or not. Um, and it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a investment of mental energy to, you know, try to build the framework to understand uh, the meaning that's coming next. So the MIT data visualization group has a great paper. I have the references later on. They, um, came at it from a very different perspective of looking at all texts and categorizing them on these four levels, um, depending on what kind of information they have. Um, and I, I really like this model too. Um, so the first level is elements and encoded, encoded properties in the graph. So that would be things like the title, the axis, the axis labels, the data points, kind of the real visual 
nitty gritty. Um, so the second level would be statistical and relation information. This might take a little bit more judgment and understanding. So it might be um, things like the mean and standard deviation. Uh, it might be how you could, you know, read out the maximum of a curve uh, and the minimum. Um, the third level, and this to me, this is the most important one, but the first two are really needed to set up for it. This is a perceptual and cognitive phenomena. So it's things you need to think about uh, in order to describe the graph. So um, it might be that, uh, you know, I have some examples here that there might be a linear relationship between two things or, you know, whether males or females engage in a variety of behaviors in faceted graphs. Uh, at different levels. So the fourth, fourth level is contextual and domain specific. And this uh, involves more judgment. Um, and it, it might provide conclusions about causation um, or um, knowledge from the field that isn't part of the graph. And the reason that I like this model so much is that the blind people don't really think level four belongs in an alt text. Um, we really just want a description of what's visible. And um, we wanna decide for ourselves about the background knowledge that's need to, you know, make conjectures about causation and things like that. Um, and be really careful with co causation in all text because correlation is not causation. Um, if there is an annotation on the graph where there's maybe an inflection point in the graph and you wanna say, you know, and, and they have labeled this inflection point happened at the same time as, as some external event, then do describe that, but don't don't put in things that aren't in the printed graph. Um, so um, that's really everything. I have some resources for learning about alt text, uh, some talks that we've given, and and um, other. Um, models for thinking about it. Um, and then uh, the next slide is, is the references to the two kinds of, of models of, of thinking about alt text. And uh, with that, I would like to send it to Andrea, who um, I think wants to tell us about the accessibility practices we use around um, Audible content. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I don't know if anybody has questions about about your your talk, or we leave it to to the following discussion. I will share a link to two slides that I that I have here for for everyone. So part of the part of the of the situation with GitHub Pages. Uh, is that, uh, and one of the uh, things that I am not doing today that I should be doing is that uh, I have prepared some slides, but I lost there's the, the link to them. I uh, will be there. Um, so we are, we are trying to, the context of this presentation is that we are deciding what, um, content should go in the accessibility guide. And of course, alt text and um, visualization uh, is important for, um, for the content, the specific content, content, content of the Turing way. But we also have other kinds of disabilities and um, lots of 
uh, that that should be included in in an accessibility guide overall. But um, oh, here I'm so sorry about the link. Uh, Lisa, I'm sharing it in the in the chat right now. So this is this is uh, part of the reflection for this week. So this is by no way, by no means, uh, work that is over. And um, I have been. Um, I don't have permission to to share. I guess. Oh really? Here, let me. Right. Oh no no no! I have it here. It's because it changed. I'll pause the recording first. There. In the we're building the. Okay, so we are going to we are going to be building the content for the Turing Way regarding accessibility, and um, um, regarding uh, deaf and hard of hearing people, the accessibility practices are a little bit different. Um, I am uh, right now taking um, uh, the as reference uh, a paper that is called "Supporting Equity and Inclusion of Deaf and Hard of Hearing Individuals in Professional Organizations." It's a paper that is written by people who not only work in the area in audition as, as practitioners of science in, in the audition, but they are themselves hard of hearing and uh, deaf people. And they have been working in an organization uh, towards supporting the participation of, of um, um, in uh, events and in, in science in general. And I have a very localized experience in Brazil, as I told you before, uh, where Libras, the lingua brasileira de sinais, is the official sign language, and where the the, the specificities of the, the particular conditions of uh, the health system and of of uh, how how public service works makes it very proeminent. We see lots of spaces with Libras and Libras interpreters and laws giving access to Libras interpreters. To people uh, around the country, so it's very common to see uh, having 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 sign language, which is not the same the case for every country. Um, so these authors, they they have a uh, three types of access uh, defined, three types of access in in their paper, and the first one is the physical access, and this is related with what we have. Uh, uh, said we have described as technical the, the technical part of the access um, and uh, it's about whether an individual can move and enter and have interaction with the com with the material and um, and uh, having all the technical aspects of of their access and their function in the space solved so this is uh, for example having microphones good microphones in the in the meetings having uh, captioning prepared uh, good captioning, uh, live captioning for, for uh, meetings, and in some cases, uh, sign language interpretation or cued uh, interpretation of, of, uh, of the language to help uh, deep reading. Um, we also have uh, in space, in physical person pre presence, uh, like person-to-person -person meetings, um, conference rooms that are compatible with hearing aids. And uh, for example, this, this is some technical parts of the accessibility uh, that, that, uh, that allow people with uh, hearing loss or deaf people to participate. But also, also there's a social aspect of the access and it's uh, being able to interact and, and be able to participate in the social interactions of the community. And, and part of this, a very key part of this um, is not being the, it's not only being able to have uh, social, the, the design of the social aspect of the conference or, or the spaces should be accessible. And, and we have, we have also, I, I think with Liz, we could, we could talk about uh, the accessibility of the social part for, um, for blind people and people with low, low vision. But um, it also uh, is related with being the only one in the room. For many people whose first language is 
um, sign language, uh, uh, being the only one in the room as a first language speaker is also a social aspect, is part of how the communities are not uh, actually um, being able to, to, to have social gatherings of, of uh, people whose first language, for whose, for whom their first language is sign language. So the social access uh, gives opportunities and gives interacting and make, allows you to know people, uh, to meet people and gives you opportunities. So this is important. And also the financial access and how healthcare and assistive technology, they are expensive. And depending on where you're from, depending on, on the country, um, it, it, is a, it places a burden, a financial burden to individuals and, and uh, hiring or paying for the services too. So when you have solutions that are uh, placed on the individual, the people are burdened financially specifically, and this is uh, disproportionate for low-income families, for example, that will have to spend money in assistive aids that because some solutions are not um, communal, communitarian. Like so, as communities, uh, part of the part of the work is also easing the financial the financial burden of 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 access and and making uh, solutions collective instead of individual. So the the organization or the event uh, is the one that solves some part of the solutions and, and that gathers and destinates the money for this access uh, instead of placing that to individuals. And this has to be proactively and this has to be with time. And uh, some of these solutions are not going to be uh, easily solved if they are done only reactively. Like on, if, if by demand you decide to provide some of the solutions, you are not going to be able to plan ahead. So this is important and it's also a way I, I like the, the categorization about the access because it's not only it's never only technical. Mm. And they have a, as an organization a five pillar model that includes fostering mentoring, fost, fostering mentoring programs. So this allows people uh, that are hard of hearing and deaf to know each other, to participate, and and this is uh, uh, something that also intersects that 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 can be. Uh, used and, and can be meaningful for other kinds um, of other people who, who come from from groups that are underrepresented. Having uh, representation and having mentoring programs and having a, sp a social a, a space where social the social part of the community uh, is um, is partially uh, addressed. Um, proactively giving equal access. So um, so we have to the fact that you work beforehand for some of the solutions and uh, you are explicit in the solutions and explicit in the intent and in the in the in the interest um that you have of being accessible will um will have will 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 level a little bit the, the fact that uh, some groups are underrepresented they work towards easing financial burdens. So partial scholarships help with uh, hiring the, te the technical part, solving the technical part themselves. Um, and also, and it's and something that Liz, uh, uh, that we have talked a lot about, about this with Liz is uh, recruiting for leadership positions. It's not only a community that is open. It's not, it's, uh, we have to also shift the dialogue from being welcoming and being open, which is very good to also, um, to also uh, or co-organizing and organizing uh, uh, things that are, uh, that are governed and leadered, uh, leaders, led by uh, people with disabilities. And um, the one that I try to, to, I, I think it's not least important, establishing the culture of equity and inclusion. So it's not only for one group or, or the other, but if the rest of the community, the whole community uh, establishes some clear communication guidelines and some uh, clear practices that are cultured, that are behavioral. In the case of deaf and hard of hearing people, um, it's also being um, uh, okay with people uh, repeating what they said and having questions and having uh, environments that are friendly. And I speak about this also as a non-native English speaker, 
because uh, some people in the community won't disclose or won't even perceive that they are having hearing loss at some point. It's quite uh, possible, but also nobody should uh, need to disclose if they have a disability. And the culture of inclusion of equity should be in place uh, even before uh, you need to do this kind of uh, disclosure. So, so this talks a lot with other uh, uh, groups. And uh, for example, captioning, uh, it's absolutely prevalent. Like it's absolutely uh, not prevalent, but omnipresent right now. And uh, most of the users of, of captions are not uh, deaf or haven't, they, they don't have hearing loss. It's all of us. We all use captions for in, in different contexts where, um, when we have technical issues, when um, we are in noisy environments, and when we cannot turn the volume on, uh, so some of these examples of use are very simple. But but uh, captioning is a good example of how practices that were meant to be um, inclusive for uh, people with disabilities are now uh, totally totally used by everyone. And uh, uh, captions also lift the cognitive burden on the audience. So not only if you're not hearing well. Uh, and another consideration is that sign languages vary from country to country. So not every space, uh, it's not practical all the time to have um, in sign interpreters. It's super important for some people because it's their first language. But depending on the on the community that you have, if it's a regional event, if it's a country level event, it's sometimes it's a best, it's a better um, choice financially and uh, technical, because you have one person more in the room and they are doing the signing and it's addressing people um, for whom this is the first language. Uh, so in some countries they are widely used. They are a low tech. It, they're not inexpensive, but it's a low tech solution for inclusion, um, and and it's very important. It's preferred over captions in some in some situations. I I don't want to talk more. Like I, I this is what I brought, and this is like part of the first part of the conversation about uh, about uh, uh, what we're going to include. Um, in the Turing way content, but also in the Turing way practices and and the Turing way um, culture, actually, um, and and uh, I would like to to give the like yes to to open for for discussion and for uh, questions also. Thank you, Liz. Thank you both. Thank you. You made some really great points. Wow, I'm going to pause uh, or stop the recording here at the end of the recorded part. Thank you both so, so much.